I'm Sam Healy with the Engineers and Architects of Hawaii. This video is from a July 2005 presentation by Alan Loy. Alan was an EH Emeritus member and retired executive from Hawaiian Electric. He was also a longtime member of the Navy League in Hawaii. Through his research, he was an expert on Hawaii naval history, especially on World War II. In this presentation, Alan details the history of the USS Ward, which fired the first shots of the war in the Pacific. Alan had a personal connection with the war and once sat at the actual gun that fired the shot that sank the Japanese midget submarine trying to enter Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Alan's family were friends with Commander William Outerbridge, who had just assumed command of the war on December 6, the day before the attack on Pearl Harbor. In this video, Alan tells us the story of the ward from its record construction at Mare Island in California in 1918 for World War I, the crewing of the ward from Minnesota's Naval Reserves, the famous first shots of World War II, its conversion to a troop transport ship, and its sinking by a Japanese kamikaze in 1944. We hope you enjoy this story and email us your comments. Mahalo. Our speaker today doesn't really need an introduction. We're all uh, real familiar with him, but uh, I'm sure that Bob would like to say a, a few nice words before he gets started. Oh, okay. Thank you, Travis, for filling in here. Alan, uh, as you mentioned, maybe a week or two ago, so he's kind of on slides now, and uh, uh, I think it's going to be fun for us to see him. It's on the uh, destroy of the ward, and the ward was the... Uh, destroyer that first fired on the uh, Japanese submarine, at, uh, which opened up World War II. So, as we say, Alan needs no introduction, so here's Alan. Uh, they're planning to bring the uh, uh, some surviving crew members of the destroyer ward that fired the first shot in the war off uh, Pearl Harbor sank the Japanese midget submarine. And so I put this together as a possible sideshow for the, the old vets when they get out here. The, the interesting thing about the crew of the ward, with the exception of the officers, the enlisted were all members of the Naval Reserve Unit in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. So it was in effect a Minnesota ship. And it's had a special uh, esprit de corps for that reason. And they're coming out, most of them still live up there. Okay, there she is, DD-139, a classic World War I, late World War I, four-piper. And this is a, the engineer cutaway, or just engineering view. Again, a classic four-piper. Uh, she's good for a little over 30 knots, 1,050 tons, uh, carried four, four-inch 50 caliber guns, and uh, she was pretty well armed. She had 12 torpedoes. So that was pretty good for a little thousand tonner. And these are the ships that gave the, uh, the, this class of destroyer the nickname Tin Cans. Because if you've got a ship that's 300 feet long that weighs a thousand tons, there ain't very much metal in it. And uh, I remember I have been aboard the destroyer ward. The captain was a personal friend of me and the family. and. Uh, and when I went aboard, I remember walking up the ladder on the side of the ship from the captain's gig and looking down the hull, and you could see all the ripples in the hull plates because they were so thin. Remember, this thing only displaced a little over a thousand tons, and so she. Uh, uh, these are the ships that coined the phrase tin cans because they looked just like that. Armor plate didn't exist on these ships. <laughs> they were the strength in numbers was their their key. But they were fast and they earned their keep. But anyway, she broke a record. From the time her keel was laid and World War One was still in progress, from the time her keel was laid until she was launched was one month. 
I should say until she was ready for commissioning, it was one month. She was completed in one month, launched in, on the third week. And here is the launching of the ward on June 1st, 1918. Remember World War I got over on Armistice Day 1918 in November. This is how she was probably painted uh, right after World War I. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, part of their strategy was to lay down smoke screens for naval engagements. And so uh, she's undoubtedly uh, practicing laying a, a smoke screen today. I don't believe the skipper was required to file an EIS prior to that drill. <laughs> You may remember the famous Lend Lease with England during the war, where uh, in return for some bases, uh, we supplied them a whole bunch of destroyers for use in the Atlantic, and the, they were taken from the 200 of these that we had uh, in mothballs at the time. Okay, this is all these four pipers in mothballs. And let's see, we've got uh, 139 is, here's 138, yeah, here it is right here. This one right here is number 139, Destroyer Ward. She was tied up in San Diego for 20 years, uh, decommissioned in 1921 as a three-year-old hull, and just sat there in uh, San Diego, and considering that thin skin, I must have had cathodic protection going pretty well. <laughs> Well, they recommissioned her in 1940, late 40 or 41. Okay, they took out 106 and 139, recommissioned them in 1940, late 1941, and uh, uh, sent her out here. And here she is tied up at the Sugar Pier in Hilo. So they visited Hilo and her out from San Diego when she was put back in commission. And of course, here's a view of Pearl Harbor, and uh, they had a submarine net across the entrance to the harbor, and uh, the, uh, the evening before, some large Japanese fleet-type submarines delivered five midget subs to the waters off Pearl Harbor, and they were all instructed to try to work their way in through the net across the harbor whenever the net was open to let a surface ship in. And so the net was there. The uh, the action in question all took place right along the top of the picture, four or five miles off Pearl Harbor. Then two-striped Lieutenant William Outerbridge was given his first command, and he uh, had the change of command ceremony aboard Destroyer Ward on December 6th, 1941. So how's that for a baptism of, baptism of fire? And uh, normally, the destroyers were all parked over here. Here's Fort Island, of course, right here. Pearl Harbor Channel going out there. And the ward was on patrol this morning, uh, that morning, uh, looking out for Japanese submarines. And so, uh, as we will see, he earned his, they, earned, they earned their keep that morning. And here's an artist's conception of that the, the ward's moment in history. Uh, her number one gun is sh shown firing here, and the, uh, the first round misses and explodes right there. You can see the conning tower, the midget sub shown. This is the Antares. It was towing a target in through the submarine nets at the uh, mouth of Pearl Harbor, which were open at the, uh, at the time. And, uh, the ward was on patrol, and the Antares radioed the ward and says, Hey, we've got something between us and the tow. Looks like a submarine periscope. And so the ward came steaming on over and decided it was, in fact, a, a submarine trying to sneak into Pearl Harbor. Uh, at least one submarine did get into Pearl Harbor and uh, fired some torpedoes. Whether it did any damage or not is a matter of debate, but a Navy, our, one of our destroyers spotted it in Pearl Harbor and rammed it and sank it in Pearl Harbor by ramming. And that submarine ended up as uh, reinforcement in a concrete pier somewhere out in Pearl Harbor today. But anyway, the ward goes, rings up flank speed and calls the captain to the bridge and. Uh, 
The other officer we knew on board was their uh, gunnery officer, Lieutenant J.G. Gepner. So I believe he had the watch that early that morning and uh, called the boss uh, to the bridge to see what was going on. And there is the number three uh, four inch 50 caliber gun on the starboard side amidships of the ward. The number three gun is the one that fired the lethal shot. Remember the word caliber in the Navy means the length of the barrel. So a four inch 50 caliber has a 200 inch barrel. And yours truly has sat in that seat right there, the gun pointer seat. Probably in March of 1942, as a guest of uh, then Lieutenant Commander Bill Outerbridge, skipper of the ward. During the war, she was converted to a fast attack transport. We'll see that in a moment. But her four inch guns were removed. And so, even though the war didn't survive the war, and that's part of the story, her main battery did. And that gun today is located in front of the state capitol in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, it's, it's, the story goes that former governor, uh, what was it, Jesse, what was his name? Ventura. Ventura. Jesse Ventura used to take his box lunch and go out and sit under that gun and have his lunch every day. So that's one thing I have in common with Jesse. Uh, Bill Outerbridge assumed command of the ward on December 6th, 1941. It was his first command, 24 hours before his moment in history, you might say. One of two interesting moments, more on that later. But he was a two-stripe lieutenant, which was pretty common to command a small destroyer like the Ward. And this is a, a month or so after. Now, this all comes down to this. Bill Outerbridge, this new skipper, was given an opportunity to make a decision knowing that whatever he decided, the mo literally, literally Monday morning quarterbacks would later decide whether he was to be court-martialed or given the Navy Cross. Here you see he is getting the Navy Cross from Admiral Nimitz. And you will see he now has two and a half stripes on his shoulder boards. So from this picture, I do, did know he got promoted to Lieutenant Commander early in 42, and there's photographic evidence of Bill's promotion. Well, there were uh, five of these submarines, and this one, uh, of course, uh, uh, his gyros went out, and he didn't feel he could attempt to uh, try to enter the harbor, so he motored, that's all they had was battery power, motored around Makapu and ended up running out of juice, I guess, there at Bellows Field. You can see the Lanikai Mokulua Islands in the background there. And, uh, with an assist from the waves that eventually washed up on the beach. A crew of two, one officer and ensign and one enlisted man. Uh, the uh, enlisted man apparently didn't know how to swim. The officer did get out of the sub and did come ashore and became our first prisoner of war, much to his embarrassment, uh, the skipper of that submarine. One submarine was rammed and sunk in Pearl Harbor. The ward submarine was sunk and uh, we'll get to see a lot of that in a minute. And uh, another one was sunk and ended up in Kehi Lagoon. And the fifth one disappeared. Now this one hung around here for a while as a museum exhibit, and then it was borrowed to go back to the mainland for a, uh, I guess, bond drive or something. And it ended up in Texas. I think it's at the Nimitz Museum in Texas. And it's our submarine, darn it. And we're supposed to get it back. But uh, Texas is not being cooperative. Okay, this is a somewhat controversial photograph taken by the Japanese. You can see the early, all the torpedo planes came in here. There you can see the torpedo wakes. And here you can see uh, the, the oil leaking out from the tanks of, uh, this would be the West Virginia right here. And you can see the torpedoes that hit the Oklahoma over here. The big controversy is what are those three white plumes? Some people say they, uh, these uh, midget submarines were very hard to control depth-wise. They didn't have stern planes. And so when he fired the torpedoes, he's light. And in trying to dive, he may have kicked his stern up out of the water and his propeller blades might have thrown those three splashes. And 
to carry two torpedoes and those might have been his torpedo wakes. Or there could have been a simultaneous attack from torpedo aircraft. Anyway, there's a big debate going on over what that photograph actually represents. Okay, the uh, Mackay Pier gang out there, U of H research group, uh, are very active with their PC, Pisces, what is it, two, three, and four, and whatever. And they're always having to train their uh, operators. And they do it off Pearl Harbor. And so their supervisor was very good about this for his training missions. He did a grid for the whole area off Pearl Harbor, and every training mission was in a different grid. And by gosh, about two or three years ago, they found it. And so that's what this next series of slides are all about. Here she is lying on the bottom, actual photographs from the uh, undersea research vehicle. There were two of them down there, one illuminating. If you got two, you can take prettier pictures because the other one goes over and lights the subject for you. You can see the light from the other one over here. Now these things were built very much like torpedoes. They had a coaxial rotating prop, but they had no stern planes. They just had rudders inside the screws there. So they were in effect manned torpedoes in a way. It was discovered by the University of Hawaii on the floor about a thousand feet deep somewhere off the mouth of Pearl Harbor. There was a bit of a controversy there because Bob Ballard, who did an excellent job on the Titanic and the Yorktown, came out to look for it and he couldn't find it. He said, well, if we couldn't find it, it must not be there. Uh, please. <laughs> When the ward went after the submarine, the number one gun fired first and missed, and the number two gun fired second, and a observer on the stern of the ward says, yes, by gosh, I saw the round hit the base of the conning tower. And if you look very closely, you can see there is a sort of a dent right there. And you go to the next slide. And by gosh, there it is. A very neat four-inch hole. The good news is it was too, either too close to the ship, the board, and so the, the projectile had not armed itself, or it was a dud. But one way or another, that was a big break because the velocity had penetrated the probably thin skin of the submarine, probably rattled around inside, and probably made a matching hole going out the other side of the hull, and that was just right to let the water in one side and the air out the other, and she sank in mint condition. Because if that had gone off, it would have been a pile of scrap iron. But it didn't go off, and so we have a very good artifact. Okay, here's the, the ward uh, put in a few more months on patrol and then was sent back to the West Coast to be recommissioned as a fast attack transport. And uh, what they did, that's how she looked when she went back to the West Coast. And when they got through rebuilding her, she looked like this. She's now APD number 16 instead of DD-139. They took out two of her four boilers, removed two of her four stacks, put accommodations here for up to 200 troops. And a whole bunch of these were converted and assigned to Douglas MacArthur's Navy. And these were the ships that helped his island hopping campaign across the South Pacific. And the ward was involved in 16 such invasions. It was a very busy ship. Is that at Pearl Harbor? I believe it was done on the mainland, the conversion work. But uh, she was also assigned to carry a design with special rigs to carry landing barges, as you can see right here. So before she had torpedo tubes, along with her one, two, three, four inch 50 caliber guns, and four on the others, on the port side, of course. Uh, from our spec sheet here, just to the, you can see how our armament changed. She started out with four inch guns, ended up with dual purpose uh, three inch guns. The torpedoes, she lost her torpedoes, but she now has uh, a lot of 20 millimeters right there, and uh, she now has uh, 
depth, she still keeps her depth, depth charge uh, railroad tracks on the stern that got through, got rid of her uh, T guns. And uh, she got some sort of a projectile launcher here, which I guess could assist the uh, troops going ashore. Uh, she still has her 26,000 horsepower turbines, but with only two boilers, she's now only good for uh, uh, 29 knots instead of 34 knots. That's for the engineers in the audience. <laughs> and for those that like statistics, all the numbers are here. Let me take a look at some of them. Just for refresh the memory. Okay. Is a destroyer? Full load, well, she was nominal 1,060 tons, full load 12, 1,247 tons, and but she got heavier. She's now 1,600 tons. These are her dimensions here. Anyway, this is how she looked, artist conception, as a, uh, as a fast troop transport. So did that same captain stay with it? No, no. Uh, Bill uh, Outerbridge got promoted to a fancier destroyer, eventually commanded the destroyer O'Brien, and uh, more on that later. Okay, this is how she was. She uh, was given uh, these landing barges, and these racks would haul the barges up out of the water. I guess those were LCVPs, Higgins boats. And here we actually see a, uh, one of the LCVPs uh, with just tied up alongside with the cargo nets going down there. That's uh, how you would get aboard. They'd flop a cargo net over the side and everybody would climb down. And here you can see the davits that hold the landing barges on the hull there. The ward was involved in 16 invasions as MacArthur leapfrogged his way up through New Guinea and the Halmaheras and New Britain and New Ireland and uh, along the north coast of New Guinea and Hollandia and whatever, she only lost one man who was lost overboard and drowned. She went through the whole war without any battle fatalities to her crew. Now. She ended up at the landing, the invasion of Ormoc Bay, right there. Here is Leyte, and here is Leyte Gulf, and of course our big invasion of the Philippines was there at Leyte Gulf. And so she was, the Japanese were reinforcing, there were more troops on Leyte after we invaded than there were before, and they were coming in through Ormoc. So MacArthur ordered an invasion of Ormoc, and the ward was, uh, assigned to the Ormoc invasion. And here's how she looked, or at least one of her sisters, with her uh, landing barges uh, set up for transit across the sea there. This is not necessarily taken for that invasion, but that's how she looked for all those invasions working with MacArthur up through the South Pacific. Now, the ward put her 160 troops ashore at Ormoc Bay all right, and then while withdrawing from the bay, a Japanese kamikaze attack occurred. And the Battle of Leyte Gulf is where the Japanese uh, commissioned systematic kamikaze attacks for the first time. And so they had, these were twin engine bombers on kamikaze missions. And they sank one of our other destroyers and one of their twin engine bombers crashed into the ward right here. In fact, the hull was so skinny, the engines went right through the ship, one in one side and out the other. But she did catch fire from the gasoline aboard the aircraft and all her machinery shut down and her ammunition lockers were not flooded. And so the captain ordered abandoned ship and the question is what did the other destroyers and the escorting destroyers came over to help out and uh, the admiral in charge of the mission said scuttle the ward. You know, after all she's World War I vintage and her ammunition lockers could go up at any time, get rid of her. And so uh, one of the brand new 2200 ton destroyers who had been assigned the mission to support the Ormoc Bay invasion was the O'Brien, and the O'Brien had a skipper named William Outerbridge, and he went over and helped rescue his crew. The same crewmen were assigned to this ship throughout the war, and despite this incident, they only 
only had one casualty in the whole war from a guy that fell overboard. So it, the ship had a very successful career. But this is one of the great ironies of history. The Bill Outerbridge got ordered to sink his first command on exactly the same anniversary, December 7th, 1944. And here's the Ward's battle flag here. The, her anti-aircraft did successfully shoot down a number of Japanese aircraft. Death charged a couple of Japanese submarines, uh, one, of, one of which is a DD-139, of course. And uh, here is uh, a list of her battle stripes. A very, very busy little ship. Today, the number three four-inch gun sits on a concrete pedestal in front of the state capitol building in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I am told that Governor Jesse Ventura used to go out and have his brown bag lunch and sit on the gun platform. <laughs> and here's the, uh, the last shot of my series, uh, how I started the uh, introduction and say goodbye to the Sneak Destroyer. Any questions? Or did I cover it all? No, these, she's an oil burner, but remember, one of their important assets was to, to make smoke. If you ask me to show you Late A Gulf, I will show you destroyers making smoke screens to save the Jeep carriers from Korea's battleships. It was quite effective because the Japanese didn't have radar. And so smoke screens were, uh, shall we say, original stealth technology. And all you need to do is cut back on the air down there in the oil-fired boilers, and they smoke like the devil. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Give you, a, give you a certificate. Engineers and architects of Hawaii welcome your comments on this program and any of our recent programs. We encourage your direct participation in this community outreach. So please email us your comments and ideas at eahawaii at gmail.com.